So everybody, welcome to Turning Towards Life. It is Christmas Eve, uh, certainly in our family, and we are here to be together again. Um, it's Christmas tomorrow. Most people are in some kind of holiday season at the very least, and we would like to wish you either a Merry Christmas or a Merry anything else you're up to as well. Um, it is a real joy to be here and to be considering Justin's source, The Cradling by Joanna Macy today. Um, and so we are very, very happy to be here as usual. I wanted to say a quick thank you to anybody who has liked us on YouTube or subscribed to our YouTube channel, should I say. We're now on 69 subscribes and we have to get to 100 to get our unique URL. So thank you so much those 69 people who clicked the, the red subscribe button on YouTube. We are sincerely appreciative of your support. Um, and we've also been fielding some comments about our videos not showing up in the correct way in order for you to watch them later on and maybe indeed live as well. So we're just trying to figure that out and we're gonna continue to see how we can do that. But if in doubt, you can go to the YouTube channel and watch every video and Justin's done this really nice thing where he's put like a title page on so you, and a title so you know which video is which and from which week. So please go to YouTube if you can't find the video on Facebook in exactly the right place because I have the same trouble if I go back and, and want to, to see what your comments are. Sometimes it's really hard for me to find the video and all I can find is the one that got pinned once or something. So um, we are working on that and thank you for your patience and um watch this space for us figuring it out a little bit more so justin's going to give us a little bit of background i think on how come this particular source and then we are going to begin <clears throat> so good morning everyone i'm i'm really pleased we're doing this again this morning and i know that <clears throat> for those of you who are with us live who've been hanging on whilst we've been sorting out a couple of technical difficulties i'm glad you're still with us um so this, this source, which I picked this morning, here's the history to it. Uh, some weeks ago, four, five, six weeks ago, here on Turning Towards Life, we picked a piece by Joanna Macy called Personal Guidelines for the Great Turning, which I know that um, Lizzie, you and I found very powerful and meaningful to bring. Joanna, <clears throat> Joanna's work is, you can um, go and look her up, of course, if you're interested, is all to do with supporting people in turning into the world right at the moment where there's uh, turmoil, where we're uncertain, where we need to change course, and it's hard to do. And it's enormously wise, warm, bold work that she does. And here's what happened was we used this source here in the group. And then, as I'm sure many of you will know, big part of the shared commitment Lizzie and I have is to the organization that we're both involved with, um, Third Space. And last Friday, we held a graduate, our annual graduate workshop for Third Space, which was open to anybody who's been a graduate of our classes here in the UK at any point over the recent years. And well, I can hear myself coming back again, Lizzie, that was, maybe you were playing at your end. Um, so that knocked me off track for a moment. Oh yeah, so last Friday we were running this workshop and the Joanna Macy source that we used here in this group became the inspiration for the workshop. And we ran an entire day based around her work that connects. And it was a really powerful and um, beautiful day. And right in the heart of the day, we used this meditation that she's written called The Cradling. And it was uh, extraordinarily moving. And it certainly one of the things that it did, um, as you'll see when we read it, is it showed me again how easily we miss one another. And what, what I mean by that is how easy it is to treat other human beings as something less than human beings. Of course, even the people that we love the most, but also people we don't know, people who have strongly different views from us, the people who voted the other way for us, 
in a referendum or in an election or the people who stand up and say we hate and we're frightened by the things that you stand for or the people who things that they stand for we're frightened by that we so easily do this all the time that we turn other people into non-humans and that so much of the difficulty in the world comes from this historically and now and this was an amazing reminder of what we all are. So I thought we could uh, read it together. And as we do this, <clears throat> of course, we'll talk about it in the way that we usually do. If you're watching this, my suggestion is that you imagine doing this exercise with another person. You'll see holding their hand, holding their head. This would be one way of doing it. And you can even try the exercise at some point. You can look up the full text of it somewhere. Um, but there was one other thing that I wanted to say about it before we began, which was <clears throat> in, in my mind, choosing this on Christmas Eve was very purposeful. So although my own background isn't in the Christian narrative, one of the things that's very clear to me is that this is a time of marking the um, entrance into the world of um, the divine and the human all at the same time. And I think that this piece is about that as well. It's about the sanctity and the sacredness of life, which every time I come up towards Christmas seems to me a big part of what the whole thing is about. So in this odd way that here I am, a Jewish person bringing my Christmas choice. This is my Christmas choice for our work together. How does that sound, Lizzie? Do you want to add anything else? Sounds, or should we just it sounds totally beautiful. And I think, you know, for lots of people at this time of year, there's so much stuff that goes on with family and also so many ways to lose sight of this with one another. You know, all it takes is, you know, one meal or cooking something or people being late. Or, you know, there's so many opportunities for kerfuffles. And this feels like a return home to sanity in amongst what can be quite insane around this time of year. So we're going to read the first part of this and then we're going to stop to talk about it. So Lizzie, will you start? Yes. Is that what we agree? It doesn't matter. No, we're doing what we the other way around. I'm going to start. Here okay. we go. <laughs> so imagine, um, imagine as you hear us read this or as you follow along that you're sitting with another human being. It could be somebody you know and love it could be somebody in your own family or community or circle of friends who you love and or who you're in some difficulty with or it could be someone who you barely know and the reason you barely know is because you imagine there's some vast difference between your worlds maybe there is a vast difference between your worlds pick a politician whose views you strongly disagree with or you know who knows so you could choose anybody <clears throat> here we go this is what joanna macy wrote for this exercise <coughs> lift gently your partner's arm and hand cradle it feel the weight of it flex the elbow and wrist notice how the joints are hinged to permit variety of movement. Behold this arm as if you had never seen it before, as if you were a visitor from another world. Observe the articulation of bone and muscle, turning the palm and fingers. Note the intricacy of structure. What you now hold is an object unique in our cosmos, the human hand of planet Earth. In the primordial seas where once we swam, that hand was a fin, as it was again in its mother's womb. Feel the energy and intelligence in that hand, that fruit of a long evolutionary journey of efforts to swim to push, to climb, to grasp. 
Note the opposable thumb, how clever and adept it is. Good for grasping a tool, a gun, a pen. Open your awareness to the journey it has made in this present lifetime. How it opened like a flower when it emerged from the mother's womb. How it reached to explore and to do. This hand learned to hold a spoon, to throw a ball, to write its name, to wipe tears, to give pleasure. There is nothing like it in all the universe. Lift now your partner's other hand and arm. Observe the subtle differences from its twin. This hand is unique, different from all other hands. Turning it in yours, feel the life in it. And note also its vulnerability. No shell encases it, but those fingertips, that palm, are instruments for sensing and knowing our world, as well as for doing. Flexible, fragile hand, so easy to break or burn. Be aware of how much you want it to stay whole, intact, in the time that is coming. It has tasks to do that your partner can't even guess at. Reaching out to people in confusion and distress, helping, comforting, showing the way. This hand may be the one that holds you in the moments of your own dying. Give you water or a last touch of reassurance. The world of sanity and decency that lies ahead will be built by hands like this one. So, of course, there's more to this and we may get to it in the time we'll see. <clears throat> um, and one of what's immediately striking me about it, Lizzie, that is um, both seems to me so touching and so important is we forget, I forget how absolutely astonishing we are so easily. And it works, it works in both ways. So I forget how astonishing I am. Like it's so easy to imagine that I'm some, I don't know, useless, inconsequential something. And it's the same move with other people. And one of the things that really struck me when we did this, we read this last week in this workshop was um, if we saw one another in this way, we wouldn't want to hurt one another. Mm. What we'd mostly want to do is to take care of one another. When we recognized our sacredness. Yeah and our unlikeliness and also the um, unbelievable possibilities that lie before us when we take action and when we take action together. And we would feel so, well, I would feel so hopeful every time I came at the world this way. Yeah. Yeah. And the reading of this for me is bringing me into this reflection on what it really means and what kind of practices we have to have to be able to receive life. And life is extraordinarily deep and rich and intricate and meaningful in ways that are so huge that many times it's just easier to go to sleep to that. And this is a reminder and a way in to the preciousness of life. And I find it really hard to receive my life. You know, I have to, I have to consciously relax my body all the time to be in receipt of the gift of life because 
when I find myself in appreciation and when I find myself in gratitude, sometimes I don't know how to make myself big enough to receive what it is on offer. And I'm just thinking of this week. It, you know, we, we this year we've refurbished our house and we haven't really had a place that's a kind of livable place for like probably nearly a couple of years. And then we moved back in here in October and we had our first dinner party where people came around who we really care about and we love and we had such a lovely time. And in the, in the moment, I, I had such an amazing time. And then afterwards, I felt my body kind of in some way not be able to receive just how joyful it was to be able to feed people and give them some wine that they enjoyed and be in a space that we had created. And I got to see just how hard it is to be in receipt of the joy and the sacredness of even the possibility of being and the privilege to be even able to do anything like that at all. And I can feel it now, like there's something about receiving that's really, really challenging for me. And I find this like an invitation and a kind of balm, a physical balm to make the field that would be able to receive what this is saying, which is pointing to everything that has gone before to lead us to this point, And that we rarely, rarely acknowledge that this was once a fin, for example. The, 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 the nature of evolution and the journey, that impetus, that natural growing that we are, there is so much to study, to be grateful for, to feel, to, to consider in our process of, of unfolding. And it feels very shifting to read this and to hear you reading it as well. And to read it in a certain way with a certain intention that is to participate in it, not, not to read it to consume it or something, but to read it as a participation in it, as an intentional thing. It, it appeared very differently to me than when I just read it on the internet when you posted it, for example. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes I talk and I wonder if it makes sense to anybody, but this is, this is how it occurs in this moment in my life. And I'm really, uh like opened by it is how i feel mm -hmm. i'm re reflecting lizzie whilst you're talking about this about <clears throat> for some reason um an image was coming to me i was listening to you talking about being around your table at home with people you love and how hard it can be even then to really open to the miracle of being together and of being alive and all of that. My thoughts went in a very different direction. My thoughts went to um, the many times in the course of the work that I do and the work that we do when I found myself sitting around a table with, with people. I was thinking, as I've often been thinking recently about the world of organizations and the world of work and where I've sat around the table and I've, I felt um, threatened. Mm. I'm afraid I don't want to be here. What do I have to say anyway? I'm going to get thrown out. All of these things, which are very easy fears for me. And imagining what it would be like to have a practice or a, a, a ritual, even if it was only for me, but I'm being bolder and imagining for all of us. of noticing one another's hands. And saying, being able to say exactly what you just said, which was, this was once a fin in an ancient ocean. And it was also, as um, Joanna Macy so beautifully says, it was also once a fin in the womb of the mother of whoever gave birth to this person. Mm -hmm. And then we're in different kind of relationship with one another, even if we have a difficult conversation to have or we're in disagreement. Mm. We've re-established some deep common ancestry and we've also re-established a deep kind of um, sanctity between us. Mm. 
and how absent our culture is of rituals that would help us to do that. For most of us, most of us don't have practices and rituals that help us remember, oh my goodness, I'm this, and so is everyone else, and look what that means. It's, it's absent. We, we, um, we throw ourselves in from one thing to another. Mm. You know, we do this in our families, and we do this with our friends too. We do this with people down the street. We do this when we watch TV and we see people see what's going on in the world. And it feels very, you know, very sort of um, touching for me to think at this time of year, when, when in fact, for so many of us, we've also lost that sense that this might be a time of year where that's the move to make is to turn towards the, even with the people with whom we have the most difficulty, our shared aliveness, our shared humanity and the deep mystery and unlikeliness of us being here at all. But instead, what we so easily do is we throw ourselves into consumption and we throw ourselves into mm. impressing people and all of those kind of things. Yeah. So I'm, I'm imagining a world and a life in which we um, purposefully take up practices that have us remember this. Mm -hmm. In my more radical imagining, I imagine us all doing this together right at the moment when we want to be the most businesslike or the most, you know, mm. go into a shop and are about to buy something and um, we're going to pay the cashier to be able to see the person who's sitting behind the till this way or the person who pushed in front of us in the queue. Mm. Anyway, I suppose I'm not talking about this theoretically. I'm talking about how, how often I forget this yeah. and how grateful I am for the feel of this being in this conversation that reminds me mm. yeah should we read a bit more yeah <clears throat> i'm going to jump ahead a little bit i'm mindful of the time mm. Lizzie, i thought we should um oh no we did actually get to where i thought we were going to go <laughs> that's fine here we go so this is for this part you have to imagine one way you can do this is um you're kneeling down behind another person's head. So if you imagine the other person lying on the ground on their back and you are cradling their head, the back of their skull this way. Now hold your partner's head, cradling it with reverence for what you now hold in your two hands is the most complex object in the known universe a human head of planet Earth, a hundred billion neurons firing in there, vast potential for intelligence. Only a portion has been tapped of its capacity to perceive, to know, to vision. Your hands holding your partner's head. That is the first touch your partner knew in this life coming out of the womb into hands, like yours as a doctor or midwife. Now within that skull is a whole world of experience, of memories, of scenes and songs, beloved faces. Some are gone now, but they still live in the mansions of that mind. It is a world of experience that is totally unique and that can never be fully shared. In that head too are dreams of what could be, visions that could shape our world. Closing your eyes for a moment, feel the weight of that head in your hands. It could be the head of a Chinese worker or a Nicaraguan mother, of an American general or an African doctor. Same size, same weight just about, same vulnerability, same capacity for dreams that could guide us through this time. Looking down at this head, Think of what this person may have to behold in the times that are coming, the choices to be made, the courage and endurance needed. Let your hands of their own intelligence express their desire that all be well with that head. Perhaps there is something that you want your partner to keep in mind, something you want them not to forget in times of stress or anguish. If there is, you can quietly tell them now as you lay their head back down.
the part that has uh, touched me so much every time of this extraordinary second part as he is um, this could be the head of a Chinese worker a Nicaraguan mother an American general an African doctor it's, it's had a very profound effect on me in the last week or so since we um, did this workshop when I see people uh, people who are powerful in the world right now who are politically powerful with whom I strongly disagree or about whose actions I get frightened mm. and I remember that um, two things I remember one is uh, we're all the same our heads are the same size mm. we have the same kind of brains inside them and the same kind of vulnerability and the same kind of possibility and of course, we can use it in all different kinds of ways, but I feel both less afraid, more, um, I think we talked about this some weeks ago, I feel right-sized, mm -hmm. like I don't need to be small and I don't need to try and be giant. I just need to be human and take action as and where I can mm -hmm. and stop making other people into details. <laughs> throwing my laptop off the top of my, uh, <laughs> being, being much too effusive and it's all balanced here. Um, I don't need to be afraid. Like I don't need to make myself tiny or giant in order to respond to the world because mm. everyone, no matter how powerful or powerless they are, is the same kind of thing. Yeah. That's really changes things for me when I remember this. And it makes me think, Justin, like, the way we're doing this thing you know on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock coming here and saying the things we would say it, it, there's a kind of for me this is an expression of this feeling which is you know we've no idea like really um like we have an intention that our goodness be in the world and that we want to be connected with people and to welcome experience and to welcome whatever's going on in anyone's life and have that be included and welcomed in a in a safe space but we really also don't know that that's we don't know that that's even possible really we just feel that it could be and it feels like an act of humility to just keep going and do this when there's nothing sure about this. There's nothing guaranteed or fixed. It feels like we are stepping into an invitation all the time. And I think stepping into the world and taking the action that you want to take is itself an act of right-sizing because we have to be vulnerable and we have to take a risk and we can't protect ourselves from whatever happens when we do that. We, we, we have to be open to it not going well, it going wrong, it not landing with anyone and we also have to be open to it might help it might be just what people feel connected through that they get, there's a whole range of things that feels like this practice that we have now is a way of feeling like we're participating in this thing you're talking about the, the right sizedness of life and just showing up genuinely and being here and having this conversation. Like, I feel like I'm doing something. Like, I worry about the world. I feel like I'm doing something, but, it, but it's not. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's coming from a place of desperation or diminishedness. And it doesn't feel like it's coming from grandiosity either. It feels like there's a kind of equalness that I experience between us that gets then 
we get to be in the world in this particular way feels appropriate somehow. So I'm really feeling that right now. Like I don't feel big and I don't feel small. I feel like myself. I love that, Lizzie. I, it, it's very, um, I think in a way it's a very radical thing that you're saying here, which is um, really the only way to be in the world is to step in without, yeah. with our best hearts and our best intentions and maybe our, of course, our hopes for the future. And I, I, would, I would think as we're doing here with a strong sense of what it's for, for the mm -hmm. sake of what we're doing this. But as you say, the world is desperately uncertain and totally unknowable in so many ways. Mm. So what is there to do apart from to do things, say things, make relationship, be intentional. And um, like you're saying, this project is one uh, grand experiment, but it's not just an experiment in um, let's see what happens. That's part of it. It's also an experiment in bringing about a particular kind of relationship between us, between us and everybody who's watching and listening. Um, and, and knowing that something will come from it. Mm. And that's the way I, I really, I really appreciate this and love this of being right-sized in the world of taking, taking up our places, taking action where we can. Yeah. <coughs> So it's been quite something to begin this, this year. Mm. And also, can I just say, I feel like stepping into the world is no small matter because there's so much that can get in the way, but that all anything is ever made of is a trillion million tiny little things. And so people just got to be who they are if they're in any kind of way because they did things lots of times again and again or they did a series of lots of different things but it's this right sizing thing also in my mind invites us to take the step that's in front of us right now and to not worry about what the next ones after that are but just keep doing the one that's here keep doing the one that can be done in this moment in this week in this day and then you add all of those up over a lifetime and you'll have something and the intentionality in each of those steps then has the picture be painted yes and it's like we don't have to paint the picture all at once or put pressure on ourselves that it should be done by now or something yeah. but just each each thing is okay i'm really with you i, I have this um Closing thought, I think we must be yeah. about the time to close. My, my closing thought is that um, certainly up what I'm experiencing is, is that as I see myself and other human beings, and I would extend this to other living things, but this um, piece we've been reading is about human beings. When I see myself and other people this way, the step that's right in front of me at every moment is can I be in relationship to myself and to you, Lizzie, and to whoever else I meet um, with that in mind. And then can I bring myself lovingly and truthfully? And of course, many other kinds of virtues we could say, and kindly and courageously and fiercely and vulnerably. And the extent to which I can bring myself, orient myself to each interaction with the world and each interaction with myself and the, and the person who's right in front of me that way. That's how we, without having any idea how it's going to work out, that's how we build a world in which we can live together. Mm -hmm. And it's actually never further than the next moment I speak or I'm with the next person who comes into my path or whose path I come into. Yeah. That's actually where it all happens. Yep. Do you want to say anything else? No, I 
I just wish everybody a very wonderful and also self forgiving time. I, I think this is not an easy time of year for, for many, many people. And although there's this illusion that everyone's in their houses clonking glasses and having a lovely time, I'm sure that happens, but it also is in many places not happening that way. Least of all, you know, we know our privileged lives that we have in, you know, a civilized democracy um, by comparison to all the other stuff that's happening in the world. And um, yeah, I feel like I, I wish we would all give ourselves a very, very easy, easy time in this period of being with family and patterns arising and that we can let ourselves off the hook as many times as possible and bless everybody who doesn't have the advantages that certainly I have as well and just to be fully conscious of all of all of that's going on in the world and to have the capacity to tolerate being with that and holding everybody in some kind of truth that's beyond their circumstances. <laughs>